The first thing a young officer must do when he joins the army is to fight a battle. And that battle is for the hearts of his men. If he wins that battle and subsequent similar ones, his men will follow him anywhere. If he loses it, he will never do any real good. Britain's army is by far the smallest of all the major powers and is the only European power whose army consists entirely of volunteers. A small all-volunteer army which, if recent events are anything to go by, must be ready to be deployed almost anywhere. Consequently, what we lack in quantity must be compensated by the quality of our troops and their leaders. quality which has seen the British Army through the many, often desperate episodes of its long military history. The quality that depends heavily on the creation and maintenance of fighting spirit. An army may be the best equipped and most highly skilled in the world. But without a good fighting spirit, it will have no heart. And the fighting spirit we need to imbue in our soldiers and in ourselves has to be one which will survive vicissitudes, setbacks, and personal danger. It's hard for us who haven't experienced the effects of prolonged artillery fire, and I have only had a few shells fired at me, to understand the fear and disorientation it can produce, particularly in young, inexperienced soldiers. With very rare exceptions, men are not born killers. Most men can be aggressive at times, but only the mad sustain that aggressiveness permanently. When danger is severe, particularly when there appears to be no way of fighting back and the danger simply has to be borne, the instinct to survive above all, to escape from danger, is very strong. The fighting spirit to endure until one can fight back isn't an easy one to instill and it's a product of a great many factors. Very few soldiers can be heroic the whole time. It was something General Haig felt obliged to make clear to King George V. The King seemed very cheery, but inclined to think that all our troops are by nature brave, and is ignorant of the efforts commanders must make to keep up the morale of their men in war and of the training that is necessary in peace in order to enable a company, for instance, to go forward as an organized unit in the face of almost certain death. I told him of the crowds of fugitives who came back down the men in road from time to time during the Ypres battle, having thrown away everything they had, including their rifles and packs, in order to escape, with a look of absolute terror on their faces, such as I have never seen before on any human being's face. So strong is man's inbred aversion to violence that even in well-trained armies, there have been occasions when, quite inexplicably, soldiers' fighting spirit has deserted them. I went running and I jumped into a ditch, and lo and behold, in there were about five Germans, maybe four or five of us, and we didn't give any thought whatsoever to fighting. At first, I, I gathered myself together and I thought, well, maybe they were prisoners. And then I realized I had their rifles. We had ours. And then shells were landing and we were uh, cowering against the side of this ditch. Germans were doing the same thing. And uh, then the next thing you know, uh, there was a lull. We took cigarettes out and we passed them around. We were smoking. And uh, it's a feeling that I cannot describe, but. Uh, 
It was a feeling that this was not the time to be shooting at one another. That was just one example, but typical of many, when man's humanity to man proves stronger than his aggression. We all know about the Christmas truce in 1914, when the German and British soldiers kicked a football around in no man's land. Soldiers may be armed to the teeth, but that doesn't necessarily mean they'll use their weapons. The fighting spirit has to be strong enough to overcome the natural instinct for self-preservation, the fear that if you fire your weapon, it'll only provoke someone to fire back at you, or will bring some other form of retribution. During the Dofar War, at one battle in my experience, two companies of infantry were overcome by the sudden and unexpected effect of massed enemy automatic fire. The leading platoon went down as if scythed. The fire was relentless, and almost every soldier went to ground and hid as best he could. The position was redeemed by literally two or three men who fought back with such bravery that their example inspired the rest to get their heads up and give back as good as they were getting. It was a setback, but it could easily have become a disaster. And those were well-trained troops. After the Second World War, the Americans carried out some research into how many men actually fired their weapons in battle. They came up with the figure of about one in four, even when their units were in danger of being overrun. It was the small minority that carried the burden of the fighting, the natural soldiers, who psychologists call self-starters, and who are often found in charge of the infantry's heavy weapons. In the Falklands Battle of Goose Green, it seems that most of two Paris casualties were caused by machine guns, and it's thought the Argentine machine gunners were far more prepared to fight than the riflemen. It follows that an army which identifies these disciplined self-starters and places them in key positions will greatly increase its combat effectiveness. But this doesn't mean that one can forget about the rest. We've already seen the need to bond men together, especially in their smallest groups. The German troops at Monte Cassino, who endured the most appalling Allied artillery bombardments and came out fighting, drew comfort from the human contact of crouching huddled together with their arms around each other's shoulders during the worst of the fire. Hence also, the advantage of the four-man trench over the two-man when I was first commissioned, every one of my battalion's four company commanders was decorated from the Second World War. And woe betide Second Lieutenant Jeeps if he tried to dig other than a four-man trench, because all these experienced company commanders knew that there will always be at least one man amongst the four who will fight back, and so set an example for the others to do the same. I believe the two-man trench is an expediency to try to cover a perimeter with inadequate manpower. If one man is wounded or killed, the other's going to feel very lonely. Will he continue to fight? Some will, some won't. Better to reduce your perimeter to one that you can hold with four-man trenches you can rely upon than to risk a hole in your defenses. Every aid to this bonding process needs to be exploited. Hard training together, regimental tradition and pride, putting men together who have common roots, whether from the same family, race, or geographical area. Some of these factors are more important than others, but they all help to produce that fighting spirit and the determination not to let the other members of the bonding group down. The Israeli Defense Force also draws strength from the fact that all its battles have been fought to ensure the very survival of the Jewish nation. If the bonds of civilian life can be used to help build the fighting spirit of military units, are some civilian cultures better suited than others? Would it be justified to describe the Israeli Defense Force, the Highlanders, or the Gurkhas as the products of martial cultures? But a shared civilian culture, however helpful, is not essential for the production of good soldiers with strong fighting spirit. Until the 1980s, 
the US Army's policy was to put any man from any state into any unit, regardless of his background. American Marines still come from all over the United States. And members of the British Parachute Regiment from all over the United Kingdom. In both formations, strong unit cohesion is developed by good, hard and intense training designed to toughen, bond and indoctrinate recruits with a new military culture to replace his own. In poitrine. In poitrine. What better example of this approach than the French Foreign Legion? A haven for the world's fugitives, it not only provides them with a new home, but a new language as well. They've read about the Legion, they've heard about the Legion, and the reputation of the Legion is as a fighting force. When you arrive there in uh, basic training, you are, uh, apart from learning the disciplines of, of being a soldier, how to handle a, a gun and so on, you are soaked up in the, in the traditions of the Legion. They give you all the history, they tell you about their famous battles, you are Brainwash is a bit strong, but it, it's that sort of process. There's a lot of singing, military songs. Uh, by the time you've been in the region, six months' time, you think you're the best thing that ever happened and um, the greatest fighting force that ever happened, and off you go. The brutal fact remains, nonetheless, that no matter how well armies may train their soldiers or how well they may take care of them and however successful they may be in making soldiers feel they belong, the stresses of soldiering and risking one's very life make it necessary to have recourse to an array of rigorous disciplinary punishments to deal with those who let the others down. When the internal discipline of the soldier collapses, external discipline has to be applied. But mercifully, we're a little more enlightened today than in the days of Frederick the Great. When an officer comes onto the barrack square, every man should tremble in his shoes. Draconian measures like flogging and running the gauntlet were employed to terrorize soldiers into obedience. And traces of this hard philosophy lingered on well into the 20th century. I've had a court-martial for letting the round off on parade. And uh, I had 10 days number one field punishment, and that was tied up against a wagon wheel. Where they tied your ankles at the bottom and your wrists up above, and you had your wrist crossed. And that was for 10 days, an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon. Even this was mild in comparison with the death penalty for cowardice and desertion, which remained in force until 1930, and that was eight years after an official inquiry had ruled that there was no clear medical distinction between cowardice and shell shock. There was a 17-year-old in our brigade, and he left the trenches. He'd been out there, I believe, more than six months. And during the bombardment, he left the trenches. And of course, he was absolutely lost when you get behind. There's nowhere to go, you nowhere to hide. Eventually, he was spotted by military police and brought in. He was charged with cowardice, leaving the trenches in the face of the enemy. I think that was how the charge was put. He was court-martialed and shot. He was 17 years of age. Nowadays, they call that battle fatigue. It isn't cowardice, it's battle fatigue, but there were some 300 uh, soldiers killed for the same reason during the First World War. As recently as the Second World War, well-trained armies, such as the Russians and Germans, used the death penalty extensively to maintain discipline. Right from the start, I preached the fact that self-discipline 
and comradeship and professionalism were going to get us through. And we didn't know at that stage how long we were going to be there. After a few blips early on, when the discipline, the very strict discipline that we were going to live under was not fully understood, I had absolutely no discipline problems at all. I think an interesting point here is that when there was a breach early on, I acted very firmly and dismissed the crew commander in question. And another very contributory factor was the fact that we did not have any drink. In the British Army, we believe that punishment is the last resort. Indeed, I believe that if a unit has continually to punish its soldiers, one needs to look at the leadership of that unit very carefully. The creation of strong group loyalties and high levels of self-discipline in a good unit will make applied disciplinary action the rare exception. Nonetheless, even in the best unit, sadly, disciplinary punishment will still be necessary from time to time. The better the army, the less need there will be for punishment. The worse the army, the more it will try to rely on punishment to motivate its soldiers. And when the going gets tough, it will fail. I'm very happy to be here uh, rather than being there and with the Iraqi government where I suffer. No one supports Saddam. No one supports them, ex except those people who get advantage of him. No one supports him, but no one can say anything. Because if he say anything, he will be in a bad position. But while fear of retribution may help to deter soldiers from turning tail, it can never make them brave. So what can? There's nobody that hates war more than a soldier, believe me. It's the most unpleasant thing in the world, but uh, there's certain things that are worth fighting for, and, and um, we came here with a tough resolve, and we still have a tough resolve, and we've got a job to do, and, and we'll finish it. We'll, we'll complete the job. So what things are worth fighting for? Wars are fought for causes, for ideals, but to what extent does belief in their cause make men better fighters? General, later Field Marshal, Bill Slim, who so successfully revitalized the demoralized 14th Army in Southeast Asia, believed that faith in a cause was a spiritual element fundamental to morale. His ultimate objective was the destruction of the Japanese army, which he saw as an evil thing. And he spread the word with an almost religious fervor. Others, including Montgomery, firmly believed soldiers should be convinced of the rightness of the cause but felt it less important to the maintenance of combat motivation. In modern, Western, all-volunteer armies like ours, soldiers rarely proclaim open ideological fervor. Yet the same is not true of other armies. The Chinese People's Liberation Army The Viet Cong and the Khmer Rouge were all driven by political ideology. Religious ideology played an important part for both sides in the Iran-Iraq conflict, particularly in the indoctrination of the younger, more easily excitable recruits, some of whom were barely 14 years old. Indeed, religion has motivated numerous armies from before the Crusades to the suicide bombings in Lebanon. Belief in what they're fighting for may not always be the principal ingredient of combat motivation, but if soldiers distrust the cause, morale may falter. For instance, in 1982, the Israeli Defense Force linked high levels of psychiatric casualties 
to the doubts of many soldiers concerning the political wisdom of the invasion of Lebanon. I think the first thing is you've got to be confident in the reason why you're here and so the soldiers have got to believe in your mission. And I think that with the United Nations Charter and Resolution, which clearly states why we're here, we can rest easy with that. And perhaps most important is confidence in your fellow men, that uh, when push comes to shove, they will stand side by side, rock steady in their resolve. The country in the UK is living this war probably more than we are at the moment. They are glued to the television and the newspapers, and they are seeing the scuds and the artillery raids, and they're seeing much more than we are. And therefore, they really feel very close to us. Another strong motivating force, especially in all volunteer armies, is sheer professional pride. Perhaps we should be more apprehensive than we are, but we're not. We had very successful training, and we are confident and want to get on with it. Well, to be quite honest, it's what I've trained for. It's what I've spent so long in the army for actually training for. Um, that's what I get paid for, to go to war, and this is what we have, at war. Well, if he wants war, that's, that's fair enough. But he's, uh, he's going to get beat, isn't he? There's no doubt about that. So obvious that it's often overlooked. Simply knowing that you're going to be on the winning side is a badly underestimated factor in encouraging fighting spirit. Montgomery voiced no doubts. The best way to achieve high morale in wartime is by success in battle. And Trotsky, writing on how to attack enemy morale, recommended the best way to do this is to kill him in large numbers. Without doubt, patriotism, ideology and belief in the justness of the cause help to generate and maintain fighting spirit. And success in battle raises the morale of any army. But consider the German army's desperate defence of its homeland in 1945. It fought on tenaciously, well knowing that all was lost. Why? After the war, American researchers questioned German soldiers and discovered to their surprise that Nazi ideology was an insignificant factor. When it comes to fighting well in tough situations, lofty ideological principles rate pretty low in why soldiers fight. In most armies, fighting spirit ultimately depends on group loyalty. The smaller the group, the stronger the loyalty. And no other army in the world depends as heavily on this as the British Army. The famous and unique British regimental system is designed to let every soldier know that his regiment is the best regiment in the best army in the world. Right. Every regiment is a family of soldiers with its own traditions and eccentric customs, a family which can be relied upon to care for and support its members, come what may. But the system is controversial, it is expensive, and it's restricted to the infantry and armour, excluding the army's specialist services. Understandably, the teeth arms are the regimental system's most fervent defenders, arguing that it aids recruitment and produces the highest levels of fighting spirit, which is what really matters when the infantry has to fight it out with fixed bayonets. 
Our regimental system is admired throughout the world, yet no country has seen fit to copy it. Many seeing the cost in terms of inflexibility and poor inter-arm cooperation as too high a price to pay. Nevertheless, most countries try to build on the past reputations of their elite units, the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions being good examples. But closer and often deeper than loyalty to their unit is the bond forged between men who live and fight alongside each other. When face to face with the enemy and possible death or injury, it's their mates, their muckers, their buddies, that most men are willing to fight for and defend. When you go to war, you fight for yourself, and most of all, you fight for your mates. Without your mate beside you, you're nothing. I had been wounded. I was honorably out of it in a warm, safe, dry field hospital. And then I heard that my regiment was going to jump off and land behind enemy lines. And so I jumped hospital, illegally, hitchhiked to the front, and rejoined my regiment. And the second day after the landing, I was critically wounded. But why did I go back? I went back to be with the men. You need the others. You need your friends. And that is essentially what men fight for. Not the flag, not for glory, not for the Marine Corps, but for one another. And the men beside you have saved your life at times, and you've saved theirs. And you're not going to let each other down. So this binds you together, and together you go into battle. one more factor of crucial importance for building and maintaining a fighting spirit, for determining whether or not soldiers will be able to cope with the demands and stresses of the battlefield. More than 40 years ago, the famous commander of the 14th Army's victorious Burma campaign, Bill Slim, reminded Sandhurst cadets of one of the British Army's abiding home truths. There are no bad soldiers, only bad officers. He was a new man who'd been in England all his service, came out to us and told us quite candidly he intended to win the Victoria Cross if he went killing all of us. He took the only room in the house we were living in, in the line, and that was his room and he had a fire in there. You would be on patrol or standing guard or whatever else. You went back to an unheated open air room because there's no roof. He had the one room downstairs with the fire, and he was very comfortable, thank you very much. The rest of us weren't. He inspired, if anything, a revulsion, a realisation that this man was a bloody bully, frankly. I didn't regret it at all when he got killed. I watched him die, and I didn't regret it because laying alongside him was Richardson, my, one of my best mates, who'd gone out with him, and they'd only been out 20 seconds, and they were dragged back in again, dying. And I watched the company commander die, no emotion. But Richardson was a mate, and him I regret. Throughout the war, we'd been operating on rather emaciated and starved Argentinian casualties. And I was dismayed to find there was plenty of food in Port Stanley, and it just hadn't been distributed to them. But my dismay turned to anger, additionally, when I discovered that these same shakons full of food had two kinds of ration. One for officers, with three kinds of meat and two kinds of biscuit, and one for men, which didn't have those added luxuries. A little bit later, while talking to the CO42 commando, we were approached by an Argentinian commanding officer who'd been at Staff College with him. 
and they shook hands and greeted each other warmly. And then the conversation turned to the war and uh, the Argentine said, uh, how could I expect to have beaten you with rabble such as this? And the RSM of 4-2 Commando seized this man and said, look at your officers and then look at ours. And the difference was so obvious. The Argentine officers were corpulent, wearing clean battle fatigues, and also wearing, incidentally, pistols for their own protection against their men, even as prisoners. And uh, a similar group of uh, Marines or paratroopers standing there all had that same hollow-eyed, tired redness of eye. The clothes were filthy, the badges of rank and insignia abolished by the dirt, all carrying the same heavy loads, but the officer was the one with the map case. British forces must be prepared to expect the unexpected and to deploy almost anywhere in the world. If proof were needed, the Falklands War provided it. Who would have considered Argentina a potential enemy? Or that to resolve the conflict would require mounting an amphibious assault, then fighting and defeating a numerically superior force on an inhospitable battlefield over 8,000 miles from home? After the campaign, American analysts concerned to rebuild the fighting power and morale of their own army after its collapse in Vietnam concluded, Shifts in tactics or technology might have altered the outcome, but Britain's superior training, readiness and leadership did decide the outcome. In the past 50 years, the British Army has been called to fight in the Far East, the Middle East, the Falkland Islands, and in 1991, in the Arabian Gulf. Almost none of these wars was foreseen. They just came out of the blue. Where next? Who can tell? Our army is now smaller than we've had for years, and clearly, therefore, more than ever before, it needs to be highly skilled, highly flexible, and above all, its leadership must be of the very highest quality. Just keep going once you've got your DS, OK? Onto that track. Onto that track. And go that down, way. Down to the left, yeah. OK? Onto the track! The British Army believes that almost everybody has a latent talent for leadership, and that in most cases, this can be developed. The Royal Military Academy Sandhurst teaches leadership at a junior level through the medium of infantry tactics. When you go over the top, you lead from the front. That way, your men will follow you. But once you've made that initial leadership and you've gone, you've got to sit back and you've got to read the battle. If you're there with them, you can't see it and you will lose the control. My American friend kept reminding me as, he, as we left that I was a, uh, meant to be an organiser, not a fighter, but inevitably to get forward uh, to see and to be able to judge and to use the uh, reserves one was well forward and then inevitably um, as it happened particularly on the first objective we, we uh, were engaged by the enemy and um, had to return fire. Since most senior officers and NCOs would take the view that the only way to learn leadership is by experience and practice with their men the bulk of the training is by practical example, like this. Surprisingly, perhaps, leadership tuition of this kind, largely based on the lessons of bitter practical experience, is still in conflict with traces of a much older system. Until relatively recently, the unquestioned precondition for officer recruitment was birth into the appropriate social class. Only the socially elite was considered fit to lead both in civilian life and on the battlefield. A hundred years ago, most armies took the same view. Officer selection by board was only introduced under pressure of war in 1942. I believe that having a commission in the army is a privilege. It's a privilege to lead soldiers.
But that privilege does bring this great responsibility, firstly, of knowing your job, secondly, of earning the trust of those you lead. And you will only earn their trust when the soldier himself knows that you're not going to unnecessarily risk his life in war and unnecessarily muck him about in his day-to-day -day life in peace, that you're really going to take uh, an interest in him as a person, in his family, in his welfare, in his hopes and aspirations, in his future, and so on. Uh, and if you can do that, you'll then earn, earn his respect and earn his trust. This view is common to all the British services, which rely heavily on the personal qualities of the junior officer, whose leadership by personal example can so often make the difference between victory or defeat. At last, somebody, us, you, me, are teaching a bad guy the lesson. And he's being put down so hard that he's not going to get up again, or at least not in the next decade and a half. Well, leadership is a very personal thing, I believe. It is dominated by the requirement to set the very highest standards, and therefore you've got to be very professional. You have to take great and deep care of your men, and you have to want to lead. You can adjust those priorities depending on each situation. At times you must be more compassionate, at other times the old qualities of example and dash are, are needed. But essentially it's personal. I believe that if the, the, the whole key to leadership is being able to communicate with those under you. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got to be a great orator to be a good leader. But it does mean that somehow you have to convey to your men the requirements that you have of high professional standing and the great need to look after their men. A very important person within this communication chain was my padre, because he had um, really a different chain down to the soldiers than their officers. And he had a splendid relationship with them and with me, and I relied on him heavily to identify potential problems which we could preempt. The work of the Padre should not be underestimated, nor should the provision of first-class medical support. Fighting spirit is bolstered and soldiers are reassured by the knowledge that when help is needed, it is always close to hand. No effort is too great if officers are to gain the respect and trust of those they command. And yet one recent Sandhurst commandant warned, if soldiers begin to know their officers too well, they also begin not to respect them. I don't believe an officer can know his men too well, nor vice versa. And I watched my young officers living in considerable isolation with their tank crews and their troops for a five and a half month period, during which stage any weakness would become exaggerated and they all did well. Now, when a young officer joins the regiment, he's not going to be the rounded, outstanding leader that we expect him to be in years to come. He must learn the critical balance between familiarity with his soldiers and respect from them. And he will be taught that. He'll be taught that by the officers who are there already and by the NCOs who have grown up within the family regiment. And that is the key to it. It is an education process. But a soldier must know his officer and vice versa, and the better they know them, the better relationship will ensue. The British system is widely respected, but is it appropriate for today's army? How well tuned is it to the values and expectations of contemporary British society? Is it a good model for other armies? The Israeli Defence Force thought not, 
and opted instead for a system designed to exploit the strengths of its own culture. Informality, argument, initiative from all ranks and a willingness to act without formal orders have always been actively encouraged. There's a minimum of saluting or formal discipline and it's not a legal order to command someone else to advance. The Israeli order is, follow me. Moshe Dayan observed, I would rather have to restrain the noble stallion than prod the reluctant mule. This more relaxed, imposed discipline may help to foster low-level initiative, but it demands significantly higher standards of self-discipline. And when this self-discipline breaks down, the consequences are all too clear. The idea of encouraging soldiers to think for themselves is, of course, not new to the British Army. But although it was first propounded by General Sir John Moore in 1800, the old idea of you're not there to think but to do what you're told took a long time to die. Moore believed that no officer should ask a soldier to do what he would not do himself. Over 50 years ago, Colonel, later Field Marshal Sir John Harding, often used to share the work of his men, working stripped to the waist, helping to lay a water pipeline, for instance. On another occasion, he ordered one of his officers never again to use the expression, you're not paid to think, since that was precisely what he was trying to train his men to do. Harding was not an isolated example. A significant number of other officers used similar methods. The effect of civilian cultures upon nations' leadership styles and systems is, I believe, significant. Our own army, for example, reflects our somewhat stratified society, whilst the Israeli or the Australian armies perhaps reflect the more informal and argumentative character of those societies. Before the Vietnam War, the United States Army believed in a man management approach based upon that use in civilian life. But this proved to be unsuited to the realities of war. And since then, the United States has moved to a more traditional leadership by example approach, more in line with our own. Today, our growing reliance on the sophisticated technology of warfare means that direct leadership by personal example is tending to become increasingly impractical, frequently at quite low levels. At higher levels, the nature of command and leadership changes, and good platoon commanders may not make effective generals. So in what sense is a divisional or army commander a leader to the men who serve under him? Before the First World War, it was believed the command of mass armies had become so complex that generals needed to keep themselves detached in order to exercise effective control. The reality of war proved different. For those in the trenches, the detached commanders were seen as remote commanders, safely in the rear, unconcerned with their welfare and uncaring of their lives. Visits to the troops might be impressive, but did little to raise the men's spirits. One private recorded, We were inspected by a little grey man on a great black horse with a glittering escort of lancers, pennants fluttering in the wind. Like many other senior officers, Field Marshal Haig often went unrecognised by his soldiers. Resentment grew and morale declined. The bitter lessons were not lost on the surviving junior officers who became commanders of the second global conflict. This is the future Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander. Alex. Monty. Bill. Ike. Brad. Old blood and guts. Their nicknames alone, evidence of their resolve to develop a more communicative leadership style, 
to bridge the gap between themselves and the men they led. Naturally shy and autocratic, Monty deliberately created an artificial, more charismatic personality. He actively sought publicity, which drew criticism of vanity. But all his troops knew who he was, and he made sure that they all understood what he wanted from them. Though he taxed his superior's patience to breaking point, in the eyes of many of those he commanded, he could do no wrong. Who in the 14th Army could fail to remember the impact of Bill Slim? Once he took command, they stopped retreating and started advancing. It wasn't luck. Slim worked hard to reverse the Forgotten Army's fortunes. And their supreme commanders, whatever their shortcomings, could never be accused of being unknown to their men. I've come here to have a look at you and to let you have a look at me. Not that I'm particularly proud of my mug, but we must get to know each other because we're all part of Southeast Asia Command now. One big Allied effort. Teamwork wins wars. I mean teamwork among nations, services, and men. All the way down the line, from the GI and the Tommy to us brass hats. Calculated public relations boosted and sustained fighting spirit. Men identified with their commanders and commanders identified with their men. Today's generals have developed the style even further. They may never again lead a platoon attack, but they wear combat kit and carry weapons. They're also well aware of the value of the media in helping to sustain fighting spirit and the support of public opinion. He is neither a strategist, nor is he schooled in the operational art, nor is he a tactician, nor is he a general, nor is he as a soldier. Other than that, he's a great military man. I want you to know that. <laughs> Boosting morale is one thing. Releasing the news is another. Information at press briefings may be highly selective, but great care is taken to ensure that facts are indisputable and that commander's integrity is never in doubt. Nobody between us and Baghdad. If it had been our intention to take Iraq, if it had been our intention to destroy the country, if it had been our intention to overrun the country, we could have done it unopposed. So clearly, there is much more to leadership than drawing bold arrows on maps. It's both an art and a science, and you never stop learning, particularly from practical experience. The reward is achievement, and it's surprising what can be achieved, often against the apparent odds, by relatively small forces with a good fighting spirit led by resolute and skilled commanders. Leadership and fighting spirit are two vital, positive qualities which will help you cope with and overcome the problems and stresses of the battlefield. For any commander who loses sight of the often bloody realities of what von Clausewitz called the friction of war, does so at his peril. Now, when you come face to face with these realities, what von Clausewitz had to say about them will be the last thing in your mind. But perhaps you'll remember just a little bit about this program. Spare a thought for those who've gone before and study the past. Try to learn from their examples, their successes and their failures. It will be a lot cheaper in blood and sweat for you and for your soldiers than both having to learn from your mistakes. <laughs>